Hello. I hope we are finally live. Um, so, uh, sorry about the technical problem. That is entirely uh, my end. I will introduce the panel and do it all again. So I'm glad that we got that false start out of the way. This is the science fiction and fantasy world building panel. I'm so excited because this is such a privilege that I was able to do my first ever YouTube panel with some of my favorite authors. And it's just been such a blast to organize this. Just some basic housekeeping. Um, I'm going to block people who are not being kind and respectful. Um, and so that's, I guess, anybody's warning. I don't think that there will be anyone here that's like that, but just in case there are, you're, for, you're warned now, the block hammer will come down. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction of myself, and then I'll let the lovely authors do their introduction, and then we'll hop into the questions. Um, we're obviously a little bit running late, but eventually this is supposed to roughly take an hour, so we'll do about 30 to 40 minutes of questions that I came up with, and then we'll come up with questions that you came up with uh, if we have them. So please save them for the end, because I don't think that I can save them um, on my end. So. My name's Lily, I go by she and her, and I'm the book blogger behind Utopia State of Mind. I've been blogging for five years, and I basically blog um, about anything I read in any format. Um, and I have obviously departed from the book blogging world, um, and now I'm on booktube and kind of all over the place, but I still blog, so it's fun time. Uh, and I will let the authors introduce themselves, and we'll start with Tori. Hi, um, I'm Tori Bovolino. I'm glad we got all the jitters out. <laughs> so I am the author of The Devil Makes Three, which came out on August 10th, and also Not Good for Maidens, um, which is coming out in May. Both are young adult horror, um, kind of with fantastical contemporary fantasy elements. And I'm so excited to be here with you today. Then um, Akemi. Hi, my name is Akemi Don Bowman. I'm the author of Starfish, Summerbird Blue, Harley in the Sky, and most recently the Infinity Court series and Generation Misfits. And I'm living in the UK right now, which I think one of you is also there. So, <laughs> yeah. Alicia? Hi, I am Alicia Dow, and I wrote um, these two books. Nope, still not. There we go. Um, the Sound of Stars and the Kindred. I'm, I'm trying. Um, and other stuff that's coming out. And um, I live in Germany. And yeah. Hi. And I'm Laura. Um, I wrote A Dragon Bird in the Fern that came out on August 3rd. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I also live in Germany with Alicia and Lily. Not with them. Not far from them. <laughs> in our communal book book blogging book reviewing house um so i wanted to start off with some general questions that i had i know that we're also doing like a sci-fi fantasy mishmash so i think one of the most interesting things that i think of when i think of fantasy and sci-fi is kind of the ways that it interrogates and sort of looks at our own humanity and so that's the first question that i have for everybody i want to know what do you think that the fantastical or otherworldly exposes about humanity? And let's start with Tori. I'm trying to see if I can like reframe my answer into something more interesting. Um, <laughs> the joys of doing it. So I think that in this world building, we can interrogate um, specifically things that we like ideas that we kind of see as the norm or the good and bad ways that we can go about making decisions. So in my book, The Devil Makes Three, I specifically was looking at ambition and seeing how we can make ambition this like horrifying, scary thing and what's the worst thing that could happen. Um, and it is inspired by Faust legends in which, if you're not familiar, it's like a German folk tale where um, if you choose to be successful, you have X number of years to live and this demon guardian um, and then everything goes badly after 24 years. So that's not exactly what happens, but I wanted to kind of deal with how we make choices to get what we want and how that could 
complicate our lives, um, specifically through this idea of world building and um, how we could like, how this could be a scary concept um, in humanity. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the dangers of specifically also female ambition. Oh, how scary. Oh. <laughs> uh, so Akemi, do you want to take it on? Yeah. So, um, for me, um, I know I, I'm sorry, I already said this earlier, so I'm just kind of parodying myself, but, um, yeah, I'm like a character author. So, uh, I kind of look at like what makes a person, what, what makes their brain, um, work the way it does and why do they make the choices that they make? Um, and so, I always feel like there's certain things in the world that are very black and white that you know is right and wrong and it's clear cut and nobody questions it, but there's a lot of gray area. And for me, that's the stuff that I like to write about because I like to see, um, kind of like write about like why people have different opinions and how they can kind of bridge those opinions. Uh, in the Infinity Courts, um, it's about a girl who dies and ends up in the afterlife and she finds out it's been taken over by an AI. And that AI has basically decided like, all of you humans have messed this up for way too long and I'm now, taking over and making like a better version of, of society. Um, and so that's kind of stuff that I like to explore of like what, who gets to say what that is. And, and, you know, if you have people who have kind of different opinions, like how do you make it so that you can kind of grow from that and make sure that the people who come after you uh, can do better, so. Yeah, I found that so fascinating about the infinity course and also like the AI aspect. I terrifying and intriguing at the same time. Uh, Alicia? So I'm also a character person. I like to go for characters and I really love to explore that. And when I wrote The Sound of Stars, I wanted to look at what it was like for a young black girl in New York and how that would shape her view of humanity. And if she thought, if she had the power if she wanted to save it um, and the bitterness that comes with that and what she thinks about humanity and what she's experienced and how all of these things have shaped her. And with the kindred, I also look at humanity. I really am very fascinated by how we look at ourselves and how someone alien might look at us. And I just, I love that. I love exploring those kind of themes and I love uh, the moral conflicts and I just love ex exploring like a Kenny, kind of like uh, the gray areas. So that's me. So, and I think I'm last. So um, for me, I would say um, the otherworldly, if it always has some kind of a connection to our basic beliefs and our, and our, also our fears. And so in the story that I wrote, um, the, the culture has, first of all, um, a really strong drive for justice. Um, so they always want to make sure that people are punished for their crimes or, or something like that. Um, but they also have a very, very strong sense of family. And so we have the problem that um, a character, um, her sister is killed. Um, and when someone is killed and they don't know who did it, um, it basically means they still have this thirst for justice, but they don't have a connection to anyone except for their family. And so they start to lash out violently and it ends up hitting their family until they finally can find the killer. Yeah, I love what you said, Alicia, about it reflecting at the end of the day about back on humanity. I think that's something that all of your books do so well. And I think that also appeals to I think an essential part of why we're reading, like trying to look at this mirror or when, you know, the mirror window, <laughs> whatever, um, about, about who we are in books. Um, another question I had, which uh, it goes in an entirely different direction, more about writing and so craft. So I wanted to know if there were any major changes to the worlds in your books throughout drafting, you know, if anything intense changed while you were writing. Do you, do you want to start our story? <laughs> um, hmm. Should we do reverse order? Because I think I need some thinking time. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Should I start? Yeah. <laughs> so I had a actually really major change. Um, 
it, and it kind of went back and forth. Um, and the, the fact was, so my original idea for the world was to build the one country on kind of an idea of a sort of Venice that was tropical and the other country on a sort of landlocked Scandinavia. Um, so those were my original ideas. Um, but I wrote the story. I mean, this is a case of one of those books that you write and then it gets put aside for different reasons um, for quite a long time. So I wrote it about six or seven years ago. And um, then when I brought it, I basically started thinking um, at the time, you know, I was being so Western centric and I shouldn't do that. I should also consider other countries, other areas of the world. So I actually changed the the world to be other non-Western countries. Well, not not to be them, but to be kind of inspired by them. Um, and then actually the own, the own voices discussions came up and I kind of realized, no, 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 I should leave it the way it was in the beginning. <laughs> and so I moved it all back and I removed any of those elements that were inspired by um, by non-Western countries. So that was a, a pretty major change. It meant like all of the characters' names changed, all the, the uh, a lot of the um, visuals changed in it. Yeah, Alicia, are you, do you have your, are you ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I write um, contemporary sci-fi. Um, both mine are contemporary sci-fi. And I just like, I just start writing and that's what I do, you know? And then <laughs> eventually somebody's like, mm, don't you think you need like a whole bunch of other stuff in this? So I always have to just keep expanding and expanding and expanding. And that's basically how it goes for me. I never really, um, I haven't had the experience yet of where I have to shift anything or where I've had to redo world building. It's always been like, add more world building, Alicia. You can't just expect people to understand where they are right now. Um, and that's still something I'm going to struggle with. I feel like I'm going to struggle with that for another few years. But in a few years, I'm going to be super good at it. Um, it's just like one of those learning things, world building you have this great idea in your head and you have this whole universe and you're like, great. But then translating it to paper, for some reason, a lot of little details get lost and then somebody has to ask you questions about it and you're like, that's pretty smart. Um, like there were things I made mistakes where I had one of the main characters was named Janelle and then one of the other characters was named Junil and I just went with it for a really long time. <laughs> My editor was like, do you think maybe those are really close? And I was like, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. And with the kindred, I had about 12 characters named with, with an M. All like 12 characters all had M names. And I at no point did that make I like didn't think about it. So really world building is just like it is what you make of it, and then hopefully you have people who help you like, you know, put in the furniture and make it really nice. Yeah, so so for me, I kind of almost forgot about this until you've actually asked this question, because um, I was like, no, nothing really changed. Because um, usually, like when I'm writing, it just kind of gets expanded on, like as I'm drafting. So it's um, doesn't change drastically; it just kind of grows. Um, but I actually, so this the Infinity Courts takes place in the afterlife, like I said. And when I wrote it, I was I wanted to combine like my love of robots and Jane Austen and superpowers, and so that's what this book really was. But I actually had a draft. So the thing that kind of inspired it was like a scene that I can't talk about because it's a massive spoiler. But that's kind of the thing that I wanted to maybe want to write the book. Um, but I started that idea probably like seven years ago. Like, and um, it was not, it didn't take place in the afterlife. It was actually, it took place in the future. It kind of like a little bit Terminator. Um, and there was a time traveler who basically went back because he was going to change something. And so when the main character kind of jumped through to follow him, um, she like arrived a little bit later, but he had already changed the world and he had basically created these cyborgs who had taken over. And so it was actually like cyborgs set in like Downton Abbey times <laughs> with like massive houses and stuff. And then I think I only did like a few chapters and then kind of forgot about it. And then um, I sort of had this like really like big fixation on this idea of consciousness and you know us being so attached to our physical bodies but what if our consciousness is the thing that jumps somewhere else and like what that would look like and what if an artificial intelligence then hacks its way into the same place and so it kind of shifted to that point to become the afterlife but yeah originally yeah it was um a lot more terminator more guns less superpowers <laughs> i'm like so sold on jane austen meets superheroes <laughs> hey um 
But so, yeah, it took me a second. Big changes in The Devil Makes 3. There wasn't anything massive because kind of as everyone else does, I add as I go. So some characters had some characterization changes. The biggest thing was I got halfway through a draft writing it while they were in college. And then I was like, no, um, and then put them in high school. But for Not Good for Maidens, which is my second book, um, I originally had it that there's two timelines and one is going forward and then one's going backwards. Um, and so many people yelled at me, which, okay, to be fair, it was valid for the backwards timeline because it just didn't make sense. It didn't work. Um, I was so like caught up in my, I want to write the last five years um, that I didn't consider that I probably shouldn't. Um, yeah, and it just didn't work well. So um, that was a massive, like I had to rewrite the entire other timeline to make sure that it actually made logical sense going forwards. And I wouldn't recommend it. As soon as you said that it was going backwards, for some reason, my brain immediately thought that all the words are going to be backwards too. And I was thinking, wow, that's that's really difficult for you to, for you to have people read. Um, wow, okay, that's interesting. I'm glad that it's not backwards like that. Um, talking about world building craft as well, um, I know that a lot, when we think of the world, and for authors, I'm sure, when you think of the world, there are obviously gonna be things that like substantiate the world. So whether that be a map or quotes or, you know, fictional stories, fictional references that, you know, make sense to characters in the world, but, you know, are new to us. I wanted to know what your process was in respect to world building, but also when you're thinking about these other pieces of the world to kind of bring in and I don't know, I don't know really, I know, it, I, populate maybe might be the wrong word because they're not like people, but um, these other kinds of avenues of looking at world building that isn't just like, this is, a, you know, a black robot or something like that. <laughs> I don't know who wants to take that one first. Okay. <laughs> um, because I write contemporary, I get to just bring in whatever I want um, and then change whatever I want. And I really have a lot of fun with that. Um, and I, for The Sound of Stars, I got to bring in and use a lot of references to popular YA books and authors that I love. And um, that was really, really fun for me. And then I could also at the same time be like, aliens have been here for like two years and that's just kind of how it is. Whoop. So <laughs> it's like you get to shift things and you get to take in what you really, really love. And you get to, um, I, what I got to do was look at what would happen if the world had changed so drastically during an alien invasion that some things would be completely different and some things would be almost the same. Um, and I liked... For me, it was looking at, you know, old hatred and racism and how these things still would exist in a world where humans no longer are in control. So it was fun to look at what I could bring in and then also look at what I could push out and make new room for, you know, room for new things. So I could go next. Um, for me, um, I, I did actually have a map. So my my story, A Dragon Bird in the Fern, is not set in our world. It's set in a completely made up world. Um, so I had a map. Um, for some other manuscripts, I actually have come up with quotes from other books and things like that that, that don't exist, but I didn't for this one. Um, mostly I, I kind of tried to look at like what were the, the two main countries that are in it? What are their belief system and how does it make them kind of translate the world around them? Um, so they could see the same thing, but they put give it a different meaning because of the beliefs they have. Um, and I once um, read something that was a really great quote about how culture is like um, contact lenses. You can actually forget that you have them in, but they completely impact how you see the world around you. And so I always love that quote and love to kind of think about, you know, what does my person believe and how do they see things differently than someone else that has a different culture? I can go. Um, I Yeah, I love that, Laura. I teach a high school class on cultural context, and we talk about that all the time. Um, but so one thing that I kind of stuck with was I was writing a book set in Pittsburgh, which 
is a real place. Um, but I had to kind of like fix parts of it to suit what worked for the story. Um, so it was very fun to, while I was inhabiting this space, because I was living there at the time when I was writing it four or five years ago, to kind of pick and choose what to keep and what to change. Um, and the things that I chose to keep were often like areas that were dear to me or my friends. So it was nice to put those Easter eggs in, um, but otherwise make this city that I still love into something that had a layer of fiction over it. And I had a really fun time doing that. Yeah, for, for mine, because Infinity is obviously a made up afterlife. So I kind of just had fun with it. It was sort of a lot of things were adjusted as I went. Like, you know, when it comes to like food, if you're going to a market or something, then you're describing stuff. And so it's just pulling kind of things at that point. Um, one of the things, and I guess it is kind of world building in the sense, maybe it's more storytelling, but um, uh, I wanted to use, I'm trying to avoid spoilers. <laughs> I'm trying to, I wanted to use like tropes, like familiar tropes. Cause I was thinking, you know, if an AI took over and was trying to make you feel comfortable, like what would they do? They would probably use tropes to like lure you into a false sense of security. Do you know what I mean? And so I had a lot of fun with like, I don't want to say I'm tricking readers, but trying to get them into, uh, in a sense of comfort that they, they're familiar and they think that this is where it's going. And then to be like, no, not really. Um, so that, that was kind of the big one for me. I also, I do like maps as well. I'm very bad at making maps. I think I make them on like paint. And um, the worst part is I actually sent my map to the map, maper, map, map artist of the book. And I'm still so embarrassed about it. It looked like a pokeball. <laughs> I have to jump in and say that um, I had to do the same thing and it was this really horrible drawing and it went out in all of the advanced reader copies and I opened it up. I was like, <gasps> wow, I it's great that they let you know that before, <laughs> before the world got to see your handiwork. Um, I'm going to have to go back now to my advanced read copy and see if I can find your map. <laughs> Um, okay, so, um, oh wow. So the next question I had, um, which we talked about a little bit, but I wanna know a lot about is how you balance showing versus telling in respect to world building. So, you know, about the magic, the world, any of the parts that we're not familiar with, how do you balance, yeah, the act of showing versus just, you know, straight up telling people, okay, this is, this is how it is. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, uh, Kemi, do you want to go first? Okay, I'm just jumping in first because I'm going to be straight up honest and say I don't fully know what that means. <laughs> and I've, I've struggled with it. I thought I knew what it meant like five years ago, and I'm not totally sure. I think my understanding of it is that you're just being a bit more descriptive about stuff and like showing feelings and stuff. But I feel like that being said, there's a time and a place, and I feel like you kind of need both. You actually can't just stick. So I, I kind of think for me personally, I feel like that's not great advice because it's kind of a, there's like follow-up questions to that for me, but <laughs> I'll see what you guys think. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I was also, I was thinking about this too when I was making the question. And I guess for me, I was kind of like, you know, you can have a passage where, okay, I'll use magic as an example, right? Where it's kind of like, oh, this person, you know, whatever. I don't, now I cut, now it's like, well, I don't want to use like certain magical books. Um, So it's just like, oh, you know, enter this person, like magic's, you know, a door open versus like this person found in this book, like a spell that does this and this, and this is how you do it kind of like, things that the character just does and everyone's like oh okay cool versus an author having to say okay kind of not not, not like info dumping because I think that has kind of a negative connotation but the author kind of being like okay this is what happened this is why it happens and like now we can move back on to the rest of the, <laughs> the rest of the story I think um I could jump in for for me I, I tried to do the, the showing, not telling for the most part. And um, there were a couple of spots where my editor actually came in and just kept asking, but how does that work and why does that work? And and I thought there's no way to show that. So those are cases, like Akemi says, that you just have to tell it. There's no other way around it, but to somehow explain the rules. Um, and I was kind of lucky in, at least in this book that I had, you know, a fish out of water kind of thing. My character was going to a different country. So sometimes she could just say, am I doing this right? And then they could tell her the right way or the, or she would say, why do you do that? And, and they could actually explain it. So that sometimes works, but it, you know, obviously not if you have um, cases where they supposed, they're supposed to know what they're doing. Um, and yeah, and then it's just, I think kind of, 
trying to add in a, a little sentence or two of detail to do the, the background explanation. Yeah, I think it can be so hard because you don't want your you don't want your reader to feel lost, but at the same time you don't want them to feel like they're losing all track of the action. Um, so the one thing that I've heard that like a piece of advice that really resonated with me was that the moments that take a really long time to do. So if you're thinking like your characters at the DMV or like the world building fantasy equivalent of the DMV. That should be something that's very short in the narrative. But if there is something that's um, very short but impactful, that should sort of be longer in the narrative um, and should take up more time and space. So I think we can look at that in terms of show versus tell and world building. Like if it's something that's going to be recurring or very important, like I think that's worth the time to put it on the page and explain it. But if it's something that like you're just kind of getting stuck in details and like it's not going to be relevant. And even in the sense of world building, like it's a passing moment or a passing fact, like it's not going to need that page space for an, an, um, for an explanation. For me, I put myself in a really bad position <laughs> with the sound of stars and I knew it, but I was like, it's going to be great. Um, but it wasn't. So, what had happened was I wrote a book about an alien invasion that happened two years ago. So like, and now we're moving on and we can just have all the fun and, you know, all this romance and everything. And my editor was like, actually, no, you can't do that. You have to tell them about what happened <laughs> and you can't like, you can't show it. You actually have to tell them what happened because you can't just say aliens invaded and now everybody's doing stuff. So I had to go back and add a lot and a lot and a lot. And it was, it's so wild because when I read it now and I'm like, I love it, but I've had a lot of people <laughs> message me and um, send me emails and I had to like block my, my contact form for a while because they were sending me really bad emails and they were like, you do a lot of telling and not showing and blah, 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 blah. Um, and I mean, I guess that's fair. <laughs> like that is fair, but it, in my, uh, you know, defense, I was learning and I'm trying and writing sci-fi is really hard. Okay. And I'm not that smart sometimes. And sometimes I'm like, you know, I'm just all about the vibes and the feelings and I want to have fun. And apparently when you want to write a book, you have to actually do other stuff. Like, <laughs> like there can't just be vibes and fun. You have to have structure. And that was, Ooh, that was a learning lesson for me. But I can tell you to everyone who was watching that I did really good on the kindred. So <laughs> thank you. Wow, I can't believe people went out of their day to like send you emails about that. Um, well, they were worse. They were worse ones. <laughs> I'm, oh I'm God. giving you the nice ones, but they were worse. Oh. Um, that kind of leads into the next question, which was kind of least and favorite and least favorite part of creating a world and world building. But um, I don't know. Do you do you want to just immediately kind of say, Alicia, what your favorite and least favorite were? Um, I love, so, okay, with the Kindred, I got to do Florida for a while in the book, and I've been to Florida, and I was like, that's fun. I mean, also with The Sound of Stars, I lived in New York, and I was a librarian in New York, so that makes sense, but um, with the Kindred, I got to do space, and I got to do new planets, and I, it turns out I really love new planets, because I was having a ball with that. That was really, really fun. Um. But then you have to go back and be like, but why? <laughs> so I guess the but why part is what I don't enjoy. But the other part I enjoy, I really enjoy is just like, yeah, let's explore it all. Let's make like have a lot of fun. Again, vibes and fun over everything else. <laughs> all of that. Does anyone have... Oh, I can't, I can't I think you were muted. Oh, okay. Does you can go. You can go ahead. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Um. So I would say that like I love when I know what's going on. So I hate first drafts, like bumbling through the woods and figuring out. Like even though I plot way too much, um, I hate not knowing exactly what's happening. And I love when I get 
to like the first round or the second round of revisions when I'm just doing it by myself. Um, and I can actually like make everything nice and explain things and I can like lean into the descriptions um, in a really fun and enthusiastic way. And I love getting to that point and actually being able to put the glitter on it and not worry about like, where is this person? But like, where are they supposed to be? Yeah. yeah, for me, it's um, I I like all the fun stuff. I like there's um, there's creatures in uh, Infinity called Dailings, and they're like animals made of starlight, and it's those kind of like little details that I just like love. It's not like necessarily a major part of the book, but it it has something to the world that is um, I just find that like I don't know, just a way to be creative. Um, so that's definitely my favorite, least favorite, a hundred percent is getting the copy edit back and then finding out that you have a lot of inconsistencies and like that and that you don't know your world at all. That's the worst. <laughs> For me, I think um, I'm kind of like Tori in the sense of, you know, the first draft or so, it's so painful to, to get to before I can finally make it look nice. But I think I had the most fun with, um, yeah, some of the elements of the environment in the in the two different main countries of the story. Um, so in the, the Venice-like country, um, they go on a boat ride and they can, you know, name all the different bridges they're going under and things like that. And, and that was just a really fun thing to imagine what would this culture name this bridge and things like that. Um, or when they go up to the northern country and there are lots of monoliths and um, things like that and, and big trees and, and forests. And um, so that was the most fun. I think, yeah, the least fun is, is kind of getting to the point where I can feel like I, I can really explore that. Um, I mean, when I get a lot of questions back, um, I don't actually mind that because then it's just like, oh, okay, what, what else can I put in there? And how can I explain that? I, th I actually think that's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, I'd like to have some kind of a stable base first <laughs> to, to start with. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm so in awe of every, every author ever and particularly you all. I just don't even know how I would begin to create even, even just, the world that I live in now. <laughs> um, so I wanted to also say that if anyone starts to have questions now, you can start like leaving them in the chat box. I will hopefully now have enough brain cells to look at that and save those while also listening. Um, one of the questions that I always ask because I'm so interested in research, I love wanting, I love knowing what kind of research you do for your books and also if there was like something that you learned while researching that you wanted to incorporate but couldn't incorporate because I'm interested in all those like little details people wanted to but then for some reason like you can't have whatever like a cyborg terminator in every book it just doesn't work so <laughs> if um that's the question I don't know who would want to go first I can okay jump you want to go first Sure. Um, so some of the things that I researched, um, so one of the, the things in, in my book is there are these things called elephant birds. They're like huge, huge ostriches that um, you can ride. And um, they actually existed on earth, elephant birds. I mean, you can look them up and you can see pictures of them. They were just, you know, have died out long ago. So that's something that's, um, that's really interesting. Maybe mine were a little different in my book than the, the actual real ones, but um, they're based on real elephant birds. Um, but yeah, I did a lot of other research. I researched like burials at sea and then ended up using like a half a sentence about it or something like that, but I researched a lot around it. Um, and a lot about language um, and the different sounds in certain languages. Um, I didn't like stick with them. Um, like it's even though, you know, maybe the country is sort of based on Venice, it's not like I, used Italian words, I didn't do that. And I didn't have like an, a perfect Italian, I don't know, letter usage or anything like that. I always tried to, you know, make things a little bit different, um, but that a lot of work went into that. Also making sure that I didn't accidentally use real words. Um, that was something I, I really wanted to avoid um, doing. And yes, and then uh, beyond that, I would say something that's more um, research in terms of for for the character and less for the world um, was about dyslexia because my main character um, has dyslexia. And um, so I did lots of research and then, you know, worked with um, authenticity readers and things like that, just to make sure that I was portraying it properly. 
So for me, when I am drafting, I like a book for me is like a movie. It's a whole brain movie. I have the whole thing in my head. I have watched every scene. I know what I how I want this book to go, and it's in a whole arc. But getting that onto the paper is the hard part. And I realized that all I all of these details are really great. But when you're writing it on paper, you have to fill it all in. And you have to fill in those kind of details, and you have to make the scene even more elaborate, even more you know detailed so that people feel like they're in there. And when you're writing sci-fi, you have to be sort of smart. Um, and I am, you know, I, I'm a pastry chef, so I can tell you food science like like that. But can I tell you what would happen if a laser went like you had a laser in a zombie apocalypse? Not really. So um, when I was writing, I had to, I have a book back there that is um, the physics of superheroes. And I have a few physics books and a few things like this. And I just, I read through them. And the, one of the bonuses is that I have a German partner who was like, uh, 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 if you're going to do it halfway, you have to do it all the way. So you're going to learn everything right now. So <laughs> it was like, it was like I was being quizzed on this at some point. Um, so if you read science and you and you read the sound of stars and you thought that's some weird science it's true science because i had to do my homework on it um and i had a great time researching that um and learning new things and you know because i'm also a fan of x-men and if you were you know if you were younger and you were watching x-men you wanted to know how mutants work and that was really fascinating for me so i did a lot of research the things i couldn't include were just things that would take too much time to go into um, and when you have 104, I think the sound of stars is 104,000 words already. So I was like, probably don't want to add too much more in. Um, but that's it. I really just had it as much fun as if they let me, if my editors just let me go, I will have everything in there. <laughs> but thankfully somebody's always like, okay, let's stop here. Um. Again, this was everything that I wanted to cram into book one, I crammed in there. But for book two, there's like a river in, um, I think it's in Yorkshire and it's called the Strid, but it is, um, it's a river that looks like a creek and then it's actually just turned on its side. So it's very, very deep and it opens up underneath. And literally, if you fall in when you like hop across it, like you're going down. Um, so it's killed like so many people but so that was supposed to be in book two and then it didn't make it in there but i just want to share that fact with you like don't jump across the strid because like it will eat you um yeah hope that helps you know for for infinity um like the world is uh you know based on consciousness and like basically what you can imagine like there is no limits. I mean, you have limits at the start because you're not used to using your consciousness like that. But eventually the idea is that you could literally create whatever. So um, for me, it meant I could write about whatever. And so that was kind of just like freeing because I was kind of just going with it. Um, and that, it was a lot of fun. I think uh, the, the kind of one thing that I had, I guess, research on um, and it wasn't like it had to be super accurate because this is an AI who's taken over, but she has four sons who are supposed to be based off the four uh, horsemen of the apocalypse. So there's, um, and they have different courts. So you've got um, victory, war, famine, and death. And I did do a lot of research about, you know, what colors that was supposed to represent and, and what their names mean. They all actually tie together to that horseman. So that was kind of like a, I guess an Easter egg because it's not relevant to the story. It's just a, a fun thing, so. Yeah. That's also fascinating. And now I don't know if I'll ever really go walking at all in the woods, just in case I fall in a puddle and somehow get sucked into another, I don't know, like a whirlwind to the center of the earth. Um, so we're gonna move on to audience questions. One I actually have from Instagram that I saved and it was for Alicia and they, uh, they wanted to know if your books were a baked good, what would they be? That is a fantastic question. Um, some of pe some people know that I am a chocolatier. Um, I am a, a pastry chef, and like I have all the whatever, and you know I can bake bread and do all that stuff. I should be able to do it all. Um, but chocolate's my thing, so I would say that The Sound of Stars is one hundred percent a chocolate showpiece. 
um, because it has a lot of parts and a lot of different like temperatures that need to be just right and the gluing of it. And it's a whole process. For the Kindred, it was definitely um, something like donuts, <laughs> like, something like maybe cookies. It was really just, um, I, I want to say that both books were very heartfelt and they are, um, but there is something very, very heartfelt in the Kindred that I hope will kind of have that homey goodness of like a chocolate chip cookie with a little glass of, you know, milk or oat milk or whatever, so. Yeah, all of your Instagram posts has not been good for my kitchen, my wallet, my my weight, none, none nothing of that. Um, what I've, okay, hold on. I think I can show it on the screen. Okay, so this is the question. Um, it's, and it's, it's such a fascinating one because I also wondered this. If you have a system or like a document of some sort that is how you keep the logic of your stories slash like the world building, um, if you just keep it all there as a reference thing or like how do you organize that in your head? Oh, hold on. I have to make the question smaller to see people again. So I could, I could go on that um, because I'm kind of a spreadsheet nerd um, and I actually actually have an Excel document for every story I write. And then the first um, tab is always the beat sheet. And then after that, I have tabs for the characters where I have their names and maybe descriptions and, and different things about them and what they want. And then I'll have something um, like the, all the place names and where those places are, what the meaning is. Um, and and it, they usually end up having something like 10 or 12 different tabs because in one I might be describing the language um, and having all the, the kind of made up language words. Um, and in another, maybe I'll have um, something to do with the, the religion or um, research that I've done about a particular aspect of it. Um, if I was researching something about the army, for example, then I would have all kinds of army things with links and facts and things that I might want to bring into it or something about flying or whatever elements are necessary for this story. So, yes, I have this huge, <laughs> huge um, file for that. <laughs> And I look at it a lot. I'm just vaguely chaotic in that, like, I don't keep things in one place, format, or form. Um, so I use Scrivener. So I'll have the different, like, research, like, little docs. But then I'll also have notes on my phone, handwritten notes in, like, six different notebooks. Um, and then, like, random Word documents with stuff that I've written out to myself. And then voice memos. But if I have it recorded somewhere I'm probably going to remember it like the act of writing it down kind of imprints it in my brain so I hope that's enough and I haven't forgotten anything um but that's basically just how it goes like it's scattered about I don't really know where anything is I know it's all there um and I hope it all makes it in and then I kind of go through after I finished especially like phone notes to make sure I haven't um forgotten anything important Um, uh, yeah, for me, I'm, I'm kind of a, I guess, organized chaos, I think is the best way to describe it. But I'm like the opposite. So if I write something down, I'll lose it and I'll never find it again. So I just had to stop writing things down. Um, so the way I organize stuff is um, this is going to sound like probably terrible. Everybody's going to be like horrified because I've seen people who have like the most beautiful like setups of like <laughs> finding like what chapter they're on. And mine is basically one Word document. And at the very bottom of the Word document is just a lot of garbage just all mushed together and as I'm writing I just scroll down and look and then scroll back up and scroll down and, and so that's that's how I that's how I write it's a, a mess but um I basically I write um when I'm excited about a story and I have an idea I write the first three chapters of it and I just explore what I like about it and if I think I can write a full book if I can write a full book I just write the full book um there's not much more to it. I am I when I write, I edit the for the last three chapters or five chapters so that I stay in the same mindset and then I can remember what I was thinking. And that's the only way it can, it can work for me at this moment. Um, when I am finished with the book, I will create a spreadsheet like Laura um, that will um, has a chapter by chapter summary, so I can just mesh those together and put them into a synopsis. And then I will leave tabs open on this spreadsheet where it tells me what revisions I need to make via world building or character 
or plot. Um, and it's like little columns. And that helps me when I get my first edit letter or I'm thinking things through. And it sounds really organized, right? Like you, I'm, I know you all are surprised because I'm a chaotic person, but that sometimes works. But with, with other books like The Kindred, I was like, I'm winging it and I'm having fun. Um, and I didn't need it. But with The Sound of Stars, I definitely needed it. So it really depends on, you know, all of the information you need. And if there's so much information that it's gonna like boggle your whole brain, I feel like having it down somewhere might be really helpful. Yeah, I love that question. Cause I think that if I ever had to do anything remotely similar to this, it would be like a combination of Tories and a Kemi's. Like I think that I'd have notes on my body somewhere. And I'd have like <laughs> voice memos on a, like three different devices. I think it would be absolute chaos in such a bad, bad way. Um, the next question is, how do you manage the balance between plot characters and world building? I thought this was a really good one because um, I don't understand how writing works. So <laughs> I don't know who wants to start us off. OK, yeah, I can meet you. OK, um, I, I think for me and like maybe everybody else would disagree, but I feel like there's different types of stories. And I think sometimes it's OK to focus on one. Um, like I've said earlier, like I'm a character person. So that always takes priority for me because like me personally, it doesn't matter where they are. Like I want to know who this person is and like why I'm supposed to invest, you know, 400 plus pages in their in their journey kind of thing. Um, you know, that being said, there's also books who, you know, you go there for the world building or you go there for the plot. So I feel like I feel like just different books can offer something different. Um, you obviously need to have all three, like in some capacity, I guess, but um, I, I feel like it's okay sometimes to focus. But for me, the character kind of comes first because they could be sitting like in an empty alleyway or something and who they are could make that interesting. You could have a story about that, you know, about them um, that still goes, you know, if, if that makes sense, so. I think um, if you're writing a book and you, that's your first draft and you focus on one thing, that's pretty cool. And then you can go on to your next draft and focus on another thing and you just keep doing that and you focus on different things each time. I think you're gonna be great. I don't really ascribe to the idea that you need to be perfect the first time or the third time or even the fifth. It really is just getting better as you go. And if you can focus on character building the first time, that's pretty great. <laughs> I think it's really good to have a plot. <laughs> that's probably number one, uh, as I've learned. <laughs> but after that, just, you know, it, it really, I think that with writing books, the number one most important thing besides plot is, um, having fun and being really hyped about it. Because if you are not excited about your own book, you cannot expect anybody else to be. And I found that the more excited you are, the happier you are you're when you're writing it. And that comes through no matter what you're focusing on. So that's the most important thing, I think. Yeah, I'm <laughs> hard to follow up that one. Um, <laughs> but I definitely focus on character most of the time when I'm writing, kind of like a Kemi, like, um, and then everything else comes in later, but also to follow with what Alicia's saying, like I will be mostly focused on character, but if I, if I feel like there's a deficiency in something else, then that's going to be like, I'll do a complete run or um, another edit just to focus on that particular aspect. So if like the magic system's not clicking, like I'll go through and make sure just in a full revision to bring that in a little bit stronger. And I think, um, so now I probably start more with the plot. I mean, a little bit of basics about the characters, but but more with the plot because in the past um, I did focus so strongly on the character and then didn't really have a plot and, and it was just a big mess and I ended up throwing away, you know, 30,000 words worth of work. So now, then I finally told myself, okay, then start with the plot and then figure out the rest and kind of every revision more and more and more comes in. Um, so that's the way I do it. And, and I don't know if I really try to focus on any one thing at one time, I'll, except for the fact of having a plot. <laughs> um, but then I just also, I mean, I, I have great um, critique partners. And so it's, it's great when they can come back to me and say, okay, I need to know more about these characters. And that comes up a lot. So I think I am kind of missing that in the beginning. Um. I love this other question. Oh, here, I'll pull it up on the screen for a second. Because 
So funnily enough, the only thing I have ever written was from the perspective of an, of an inanimate object. So I'm interested to know um, if you would ever write a story from, in the question says the perspective of an animal or some other creature, but because of my, you know, one short story expertise, I will also open it up to inanimate objects. So have you ever anything like non-humanoid, but all, uh, I mean like cyborg, cy humanoid, whatever. Um, yeah, basically that, sorry. <laughs> I actually wrote a flash fiction once from the perspective of a dog at a dog show where there was a dog murder. <laughs> I think I got an honorable mention for it in something too. But um, it normally, I think a longer story, I don't know if I would want to do it like from an animal or something like that, but I could imagine it, um, you know, maybe something that's not exactly human, you know, whether it's a creature or an AI or something like that, especially an AI, I think, um, that really fascinates me. Um, so I, I might look into that. I would maybe do like a short story, but I don't think I could carry it out for a whole novel. Um, but you know, that's like personal preference, but write what you know, and I don't know how to be a cup. Um, probably not. For me, I, I mean, I've done uh, Aliens already, and I can do some things here and there. Um, and I just wrote a short story from the perspective of a star, and I thought that was really, really fun. Um, but normally I would say no. I, th I think I'm not there yet, or I don't know if I can get there. I think so. I've already done the AI thing, um, and so I would ob obviously definitely write about more AI or robots or whatever. Um, but like uh, animals or inanimate objects, like for me, I just feel like it would just be like the world would just be so sad and scary. Like I get horrified by like animal documentaries because like everybody just dies and it's sad and like scary. And um, so I just I don't think that that would be fun for me. I think it would just make me depressed. Um, unless it was like you know like the Brave Little Toaster, where like. Did you guys ever see that? And, and like they could like they had, I don't know, they could move around and like think and stuff like that. That would maybe be fun. So like a fantastical version of that, but not just like a real like animal that would just kind of be sad for me, so. Yeah, the Brave Little Toaster is such a good example. I hadn't thought of that, but I also was thinking of like, you know that series that's all about those cats. I don't remember what it's called. Is it like Warriors or whatever? It's all about those cats that are like live in, like, I think they're fighting with each other. I think Warriors is the cats, and then there was, like, Guardians of Gahul, which was the owl one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and, <laughs> um, uh, and the cup thing reminded me of, like, Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> um, but um, another, so I guess the last question that I think we might have time for is, this one and it's what's something about revising that you wish you'd known earlier i'm not sure who wants to tackle that one <laughs> um i know that a lot of people really love revising and once i'm in it i can do it and i like it but every time i get an edit letter my brain just goes panic like red flashing lights you're terrible and then i like hide for two days um and it takes me a really long time to read an edit letter um and then i get it and i'm fine but it's if i had known that was going to be my response to the idea of revision i would have definitely <laughs> i don't know either gone into a different industry or um just learned how to to take all of this information and just you know, squish it down and be organized about it. Um, and I'm learning how to do that now where I'm organized about feedback and how I know how to apply it and implement it. But um, I have to get past that initial panic every single time. And I wish there was a way I could like, I'm prepared for it and I, or I could just like get through it faster. Okay, I'm also team panic. Um, but something that's really helped me is kind of 
realizing that you don't have to do everything all at once. Um, and so this is more my process as well. It might not work for everyone, but I do like mini edits and mini passes. So like draft 4.1 and 4.2 and 4.3, and I'll pick a specific thing to focus on for each one. And I'll either like do, okay, well, this is the mom and main character relationship pass. And so I'll work on their relationship and like by picking out one thing for every draft or two or three things for every draft, realistically, because we're short on time. Um, it helps me to focus on those things and make sure I'm not getting distracted and getting the things I need to do. Yeah, so so I I feel like it's I would like to have known that you know it doesn't have to be perfect the first go because I feel like I'm I've always been one of those people who like corrects you know as I go and it was slowing me down a lot and I think once I you know got got a book deal and stuff and had deadlines um, that wasn't working because it was kind of like I, I needed to hit deadlines um, and I went to uh, an event once and this author had said something I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing but they basically said drafting is like cleaning a toilet and you have to work with a lot of crap before you get it polished and that like really stuck with me and I was like it makes sense like you can just write and, and that was that's how I now draft as is I just kind of ignore the fact that it looks like garbage and I just get through it because then I can always go back and fix it and I think that has helped me kind of push through that kind of doubt and and like backtracking to kind of like fix things and yeah and I think for me it's it's basically just you know similar that you have to you have to get something down you have to start somewhere you can't edit a blank page you know that kind of thing and so you know, get as much in there as you can. And and then, um, I mean, sometimes I do like Alicia where I, I backtrack a little bit and, and edit a little bit of what came before so I can get myself back in um, when I'm writing. But then the rest, I just, I know a lot, a lot is done for me in revisions. And that's, that's really where the story comes together for me. And so um, just to, to tell myself, it's okay. It's okay that my first draft is 43,000 words only, you know, something like that. And then, oh my gosh, now it's 94,000 words or something like that. Yeah. Um, I think that the revising probably would be, besides the fact that I cannot create a world um, at all, probably the revising thing is, I think, from an outsider perspective, probably the most terrifying because I don't, I hate editing my own stuff, like my own resume and cover letter and <laughs> things like that. Um, but actually one last final question, because I loved Julie's question about um, what are some of your favorite non-writing things to do to help refill the creativity well? So that'll be, I've, that, that's the last one, I promise. <laughs> Um, I could go first because basically I, I'm not sure yet. I mean, I'm still pretty new with this whole debut author thing and, you know, reading and writing was my creativity thing. So I really need to probably find something different. I mean, I watch TV, I go for walks and things like that. But um, I think that that's the place where I probably need to kind of put some energy into um, and maybe one of you will inspire me. <laughs> I think this year especially has been really hard um, just because like this first part, how do you balance writing in life? Like when I actually had things to do, I was much better, better at it. Um, but like, I would usually say like, Oh, traveling and like going outside and doing all this other stuff. And I can't do a lot of those things now. So I have found that, you know, like finding a sewing project and um, maybe like knitting or crocheting or embroidering, like, I sound like a Victorian lady, but all these things that I can do inside, um, baking, all of these things, like that I'm actively focusing on something else that isn't inside my own brain um, has helped me fill the creative gaps that I've otherwise struggled with. But I'm also with Laura, like I'm still figuring it out at this point. So we'll see. <laughs> Um, I bake a lot. <laughs> I think everybody knows it. I, I bake all the time. I go for walks. I, um, watch a lot of TV and new shows and things like this. I, before the pandemic, I would, I traveled more, um, and I saw people, but since pandemic, I have been nowhere. Um, and I've become really weirdly hyper-focused on things. Um, and it's like super not healthy. 
<laughs> like I've written since the pandemic started, I've written three books, like or not. No, I've written just this year. I've written three books, but since the pandemic started, I've worked on five books. So that's not, <laughs> that's probably not good. I haven't found the balance yet. Um, just because I can't go anywhere and I feel really trapped. I don't know how everybody else is doing it, but baking's helping somewhat. My neighbors are really happy with me about that. So there's that. Yeah, I, I feel like when well, like when I'm on deadline, I don't always have the option of having like a good balance. Um, so that's kind of like so that's like half the question I guess answered. But um, when when I'm not as stressed, I guess, and things are like a little bit like smoother. Like for me, the way that I kind of recharge the like, creative well or whatever. I am, uh, I like video games and I do. <laughs> like for me, I just like to be left alone, like on the couch where I can just shut my brain off and just play a game. I love Animal Crossing, Zelda, stuff like that. And um, I, it's it's not a great thing because I'm one of those people who like won't stop playing for hours and hours. Like I just will play the whole night because <laughs> that's just how my brain works. But for me, it's like a chance to recharge because I don't have to think and I am an overthinker. Um, so that actually helps me. And I, I've always been really inspired by video games as well. like the music and the storytelling. So that actually helps in a lot of ways because I'll sit there trying to relax and then it kind of like sparks ideas. Um, so yeah, that's what works for me. Yeah, I deeply empathize with that. I think when I have, when I was playing The Sims, I would have to set like a timer for me to get off my computer because otherwise it would be like five hours later and it's four in the morning and I'm still playing. <laughs> Um, but I think that's it for today. Thank you all for joining. Also, if you have like links and stuff that you want to drop in the chat, that way that everyone can find easily your books, your, your person, your baking, your, <laughs> all of your creative hobbies, um, then everyone can easily kind of find you from there. And while those, um, may be piling in. I wanted to thank um, all the lovely authors and also everyone for viewing, uh, for making this uh, panel so special. And I'm sorry about the first little hiccup. Um, I'm glad that we were all able to sort it out. And as the timer was running down to an hour, I just was had this blind panic where I was like, are we gonna get shut off? Like, is this gonna happen right now? <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know if anyone also wanted to say anything, but that's all I wanted to say. Um, just like a big gigantic thank you to everyone involved. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I, ho I hope everyone enjoys their day and can do something creatively restful. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. Bye.